Okay, well, appreciate being here today. I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about tech advances for students with disabilities. And to start off, oh, sorry. Scroll it down. You can tell I'm not a techie. I'm basically a converted Amish person. So this is about, PowerPoints are about as far as I go. But I do know the law, which is a lot of what we'll be talking about today. Oh, it's down that way. So phones, I'm guessing all of you have a phone on your person, kind of following up on Russ's question. How was the phone developed? Does anyone know? Like why was the phone developed may be the better question. Long story short, it was a device that Alexander Graham Bell developed to communicate with deaf individuals. It wasn't to communicate with the person down the street. The reason I bring that up is that technology that you use to enhance accessibility for individuals with disabilities will help everyone, um, and especially the tech advances we'll be talking about today. Now, important thing about individuals with disabilities is that they are in a protected civil rights class. Civil rights violations are extremely problematic, obviously, for obvious reasons, but also because uh, the government does not take kindly to them. So as you see here, in 2010, the Departments of Justice and Education sent President Samuelson, as well as every university president in the country, a, what we call a Dear Colleague letter. And this was in response to a program that Princeton University started with the Kindle DX. Long story short, they said, you know, in certain pilot programs, you need to use a Kindle. That's just part of, you know, the learning. Well, the problem is the Kindle was not accessible to blind individuals. And so that was very problematic, and the Department of Justice uh, basically said, you know what, universities, you cannot do this. It's a violation of a civil right. And the quote, this is um, from the letter that was sent. It was a brief letter, but very to the point. It is unacceptable for universities to use emerging technology without insisting that this technology be accessible to all students. So then there were a lot of questions that came out of that letter, and in 2011, about a year later, there was a follow-up to that, kind of clarifying what this meant. And what came out of that clarification letter is, you know, the Department of Justice, DOJ, was saying, you know what, that letter we sent you doesn't just apply to Kindle DXs. Don't get the wrong idea. This applies to all technologies. Um, it applies to online content, brick-and-mortar classes, online applications. So for example, just uh, an admissions application that's online has to be accessible. And you have to follow it even if you don't anticipate needing it. So for example, a lot of people ask things like, well, you know, this is a small pilot program. We know who's in it. And you know what? There aren't any blind students. So why do we have to do that? Well, you don't know who may come into your program is the key. So again, things have to be accessible. Um, one of the key areas that the Department of Justice is looking at right now is websites. One of the problems with website accessibility, I shouldn't say it's a problem, but you may think of it as one, is that it's very easy for the Department of Justice to look at our website in a way they can't look at our brick and mortar accessibility. So for example, they can, it would take them a lot of time and effort to come here and see if we have the proper number of elevators and what the degree of our ramps are. It doesn't take much time at all or effort to look at our accessibility. The Department of Justice is currently developing regulations for how accessible and in what ways a website should be accessible. Um, those are coming out very shortly. It's kind of surprising they're not out yet. The DOJ, Department of Justice, will likely, likely adopt um, some website accessibility guidelines that are already in place. Some of you might be familiar with the term you know, fi Section 508. And there are some guidelines for web accessibility that exist right now. However, those are only mandatory for federal government websites. It's what we've been using, but it's going to be updated with these uh, regulations that are coming out. Now, the University Accessibility Center, of which I'm a director, actually has the capacity to do an accessibility check on websites, and we would welcome um, requests to do that. We are not going to go out there and, and troll your website and then send you a cease and desist letter saying, you know, your website's horrible, you know, change it now. Um, but we are open to uh, evaluating your website. An important part of website accessibility is captioning for videos. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the program Magpie. It's a free program that will allow you to caption a video. 
or, and also give audio descriptions. It's not just the words that are occurring, it's music and, and other things. How do you describe that? Recently, Netflix was sued by the National Association of the Deaf because their streaming video service did not have captions. And so Netflix fought this and fought this and then finally decided, you know what, we're going to enter into what's called a consent decree and make our videos, 100% of our streaming videos, uh, captioned by 2014. And they're mostly uh, through the process of that now. Um, they've got most of them captioned at this point. But again, captioning is important and it will be part of those web accessibility guidelines that are forthcoming. Another thing we talk about in the uh, field of disability service provision is universal design. There's really two ways to approach accessibility. One is we can make everything inaccessible, which is pretty much how things have been done for forever. And then if we need to make it accessible after the fact, then we'll do it. Someone complains, someone comes up and says, I can't use this, let's figure out a way to do it after the fact. Well, that's not a really inviting way to do things. Uh, it makes turns people with disabilities into uh, complainers, basically. That's not my label, but that's how we would see them because they're complaining that our services aren't accessible. Another approach is what we call universal design. Let's make everything accessible on the front end, then we don't have to worry about retrofitting it later. And think about the benefits here, curb cuts. If you've ever had a stroller, you are thankful for a curb cut. Um, captioning. People think captioning is for deaf individuals, those who are hard of hearing. Does anyone know where captioning is most used? In bars, that's what my wife tells me. Anyways, there, we don't, I don't know, but again, because it's loud, it's noisy. Do you ever put the captions on and just like, well, I can't understand what this is, it's a dialect. Let's put the captions on. Um, it can be very helpful even in classrooms. And actually, it is the number one thing you can do to increase literacy for children. Always put the captions on when the kids are watching TV. It will hasten their literacy. Um, so anyways, one of the areas we're moving towards is, hey, let's put some of these accessible technologies. Let's see if we can do that on all the computers here on campus. A couple of technologies we're looking at, Kurzweil 3000. This is basically for folks maybe with reading or learning issues. And it actually, it's a text-to-speech, it will read text, and it actually helps people with learning disorders, people who are um, second, you know, English as a second language, it can help them. Again, there's a universality to this help. And then there's also JAWS, and JAWS is a screen reader program. So the important thing will be for us to create our websites so that JAWS will work best with them. In terms of specific technologies, we live in a great time. Um, we live in the time of iPads and iPhones. And Apple products, as I'm sure you know, are much more accessible um, than PCs are. Anyways, just to highlight a couple of technologies that are coming out, Notability and Audio Note. Wouldn't it be nice to take notes um, by hand and record them at the same time and then be able to sync your recording with your note? You can do that with these technologies. The LookTel Money Reader, that basically is a scanner for currency. So blind individuals know what currency they're turning over to someone. Um, almost like a barcode scanner, but for currency. It's done, uh, the second one from the bottom there. That's a technology, um, I'm sure a lot of our students would like that. Basically what it does is when a task is done, it alerts a parent, um, or it can alert anyone, a spouse. We uh, can use this with folks with traumatic brain injuries maybe, who need follow up, um, you know, to finish up tasks. iStudies is essentially like a, a homework and class organizer. There's also some more uh, high-end technologies. Da Vinci Closed Circuit TV, what that can do is it can read text. You just put a book underneath it and it can read the text. It can magnify something on a whiteboard. Braille Note is something that blind individuals can use to read and write in Braille. The Plus Vision whiteboard is really neat. That's a technology where someone can write, a professor can write on a whiteboard. The whiteboard captures that data and it can be sent out electronically uh, maybe to students who couldn't see it. Um, it can also communicate with a computer and magnify what's on the board. Eye clickers. I haven't seen as much use of these lately. Please don't use them. They're horrible for accessibility. Um, they're very problematic for folks with visual disabilities, processing, 
upper extremity mobility. If you do use them, rather than doing them individually, maybe have folks in groups and then have the, you know, a group have an eye clicker. Anyways, um, just in conclusion, in terms of best practices, where we want to be headed as a university, making our websites accessible, very important, understanding the new standards, including captioning, request accessibility checks for your websites. Provide the universal access on all the university computers where it's reasonable to do so, Kurzweil and JAWS programs. And then feel free to consult with my office. Um, we are more than happy to help. One thing about disability law is that every individual that comes in is treated individually. Because people have the same disability, one may need something completely different from another in terms of accessibility. And you may be saying, well, that whiteboard's great, and I know someone who could use it, but I don't have the money. I'm sure that's really expensive we'll find the money because we would rather treat people well and avoid um, administrative complaints and lawsuits and, and wonderful things and visits from the Department of Justice. Uh, we'll find the money for it. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm grateful to be here today. Um, I'm Jeff McClellan. I'm from BYU Magazine. Um, I've, I've taken the liberty of uh, changing the title of my presentation.